Hello everyone, I'm Tina Selig, Faculty Director of the Stanford Technology Ventures Program, and I'd like to welcome you to the Entrepreneurial Thought Leader Series presented by the Stanford Technology Ventures Program, which is the Entrepreneurship Center at Stanford School of Engineering, as well as BASIS, the Business Association of Stanford Entrepreneurial Students. Today, we are really delighted to welcome our special guest, Shelley Ar Archambault, uh, to ETL, and Shelly is a really amazing first speaker of the year. She is an experienced CEO and a board director with a track record of building really exciting brands. She has organized high performance teams and she's built companies from nothing to something truly remarkable. She currently serves on many boards, including Verizon and Nordstrom, and she was formerly the CEO of Metricstream, a Silicon Valley based governance, risk, and compliance software company that during her tenure grew from a fledgling startup to a global market leader. Shelley is also the author of a brand new book. I can't wait to read it. It comes out in a few weeks. It's called Unapologetically Ambitious, uh, Take Risks, Break Barriers, and Create Your Own Ter Success on Your Own Terms, which comes out only in two weeks. So welcome, Shelley. Delighted to have you here. Well, thanks, Tina. I've been looking forward to this. This will be fun. Yeah, really excited to, to start the year with you. So you've got this exciting new book coming out. I know that this is something that uh, you've been working on for a very long time. Can you tell us a little bit about the origin of the book and what inspired you to write it? Absolutely. Well, Tina, I have tried throughout my career to actually be accessible. I've been so fortunate to have a lot of help and support along the way. So when people reached out, I was always trying to be responsive. But as I got more and more responsibility, it became harder and harder to actually spend time and meet with people. I still responded. Matter of fact, I still do. But actually having that cup of coffee, let people pick my brain, the story, it was hard. And I said, you know what? When I get to phase two, I'm going to write it down. I'm going to share the strategies and the approaches that I used, how I leverage different techniques and even some hacks, if you will, to really improve my odds to get what I aspired to because I want everyone to have the opportunity to achieve their aspirations. So that's why I wrote the book. Well, I can't wait to read it. I, let's, let's take a, a minute to dive in to your story so that people understand where you've come from and, and why your career has been so exceptional. So there are not many su success stories of minority female CEOs or executives in Silicon Valley and beyond. What are some of the opportunities and challenges that you faced uh, in your career? And how did you start finding your unique strengths? Oh, goodness. So yes, I will tell you, I started out in the technology industry right from the beginning. And we think today it's male dominated. <laughs> Let me tell you, roll the clock back 20, 30 years. <laughs> it was even worse. So the hardest part initially was frankly, just being taken seriously. Um, you know, getting that, that credibility. And I can remember here I am, and I actually started out in sales because I joined IBM and every CEO, I'd done my work. I wanted to be CEO one day and every CEO had started out in sales. So I said, all right, that's the path to power. I'm starting out in sales. So my very first account is the Southland Corporation. 7-Eleven stores is the, or is the company that they used to own. And I walk in and here I am, I'm young, right? Fresh out of college, you know, the whole bit. I walk in, all the men are in suits and cowboy boots. I can find one female in management in the entire IT department, and I didn't see any people of color. So here I am, and people are calling me sweetheart and sweet pea and honey and right. So I'm thinking, ah, oh, this isn't going to work. And so I find that I had to actually call people on it in a very professional, right? Not in your face way, because I had to have relationships with these people. So learning how to actually establish myself right up front was important. And it's something that I used all the way through. So how did you do that? I mean, let's get to the tactics. What did you do to establish yourself? And how did you know that sales was the right way in the door? Right. So first on sales, that was because honestly, all the, sale, all the CEOs at IBM started out in sales. So I just assumed, therefore, that was the path to take. It wasn't like I said, oh, I want to be a salesperson. No, no, no. I just saw it as a step to ultimately getting a role. And I will tell you, I still believe to this day, everybody should have a job in sales. You learn oh. so much that you will leverage forever. But we can come back to that in a minute. Um, 
with regards to what do I what I did, let me give you an example. I'm in a meeting with a gentleman and his name is, and you can't make this up, Mac McElroy. All right. So Mac and I are sitting down talking and he calls me sweet pea, right? So he asked me a question and says, so sweet pea, da, 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 da. Ah, right? So when it's my turn to speak, I look at him and I pause, not to the point where it's uncomfortable, but just enough so he knows, okay, something's happening, right? And then I said, Mac, my name is Shelly. And then I went on with the answer. And what I learned was, and by the way, he never called me that again. He always called me Shelly after that. So what I, what I learned and what I took to always do when I found myself in those situations was address it, but you have to do it in a professional, polite way. You don't want people to feel uncomfortable because if you do it in a way where they feel they've been called out, you know, for instance, then you've kind of messed up a relationship that you're going to have to figure out how you fix because if they're uncomfortable around you because they're embarrassed, then you're going to have a tough time creating a relationship. So you want to do these things, but you need to do it in a way in which you aren't putting people back on their heels or making them embarrassed or doing anything that creates discomfort because it takes too long to rectify that. I think that is a really important lesson because it's it, there's often a instinct to want to say, you know what, I'm going to be really aggressive, you know, I'm going to be really tough, I'm going to put you in your place, but it just backfires. The key is you want to make sure that people want to work with you, but yeah. you were very clear and you sort of held your ground in a polite and professional way, just taking a little bit of extra time to make it clear that um, you actually needed to be listened to. Right. Very, very important. Um, so I'd love... To, well, I think there's another thing I want to bring up here, and I, maybe we'll get to it later also, but sales is interesting and because I want to I want to double click on this. First of all, we're all salespeople, no matter what we're doing and coming in. Right. I mean, you're selling a book right now. OK, is that um, in every role, having those skills is really important and uh, understanding that also in sales, there are very clear metrics for success. Right. So I'm sure that if you were successful there, it was very, very clear that you actually, what you would actually accomplish. Can, can you talk a little bit about that? That's absolutely true. And I'll be candid. I didn't even think about that when I took the job, uh, but because you're on quota and you have numbers and metrics, it's, it's all real clear. And most companies, when they have reps on quota, those you know, the racked and stacked. I mean, that people know who's making quota and who's not. It's all, it's all very um, objective in terms of who's doing well and who's not, right? So yes, that is super helpful. But the other thing that I found to be really helpful in sales is you learn that being told no is not the end of the world. And you learn how to ask for what you want and what you need. And honestly, those two lessons, there's a lot more that you learn too, but those two are ones that, you, that I leveraged all the way through. Because what I've realized is if you're not getting a no, you're not asking for enough. And if you right. do get a no, it gives you a chance to say, why not? And there is so much power in why not? Because then people have to explain, which means it gives you a chance to learn, to understand, to put together a plan. You know, all that no means is not now. Right. Not oh, yet. Not right. yet. Yeah. Not now. Not yet. Not. But it doesn't mean like no forever, finite, never. And all you have to do is to figure out, well, how do I make the time right or the circumstance right or my skills right or the experience right or whatever? How do I solve for that? And then you get a yes. Now, did you train for this? I mean, was there training to teach you how to be a good salesperson or was this something that you just learned on the job? Yeah, fortunately, back when I joined IBM, there was real training. So that, yes, we got trained on how to be a salesperson. And frankly, that was some of the best training I, I ever got. Like I said, you use it all the way through. So we have a question from one of the students and Wonderful. who wanted to address this question of how you uh, present yourself, especially as a, a woman of color, uh, where often people want to paint a picture of you as being aggressive or dominant. How do you overcome that prejudice as opposed to you know, people sort of making assumptions about how you're going to be engaged in the workplace? Mm, yeah, so, you know, it's hard. 
I know that frankly, being a minority female, whenever I walk into a new situation, people already have a set of assumptions in their mind. Now, you just can't let that be a barrier to how you approach things, but just realize it's the case and then do what you need to do. So uh, let me give you examples. Um, one of the things that I've found is many times being, you know, I'll call it super direct, it's tough for women because people will think that, all right, you're being just too aggressive, right? If you're super direct. So figure out how to be direct and just not super. Uh, <laughs> I mean, one of the things that I found is being direct, a lot of the times it can be in your voice. So I actually found that if I really want people to pay attention, I start talking, but then as I finish my point, my voice actually gets softer. Now, what happens? Why do I do that? People have people, to listen closer. That's right. They have to listen closer. And oh, by the way, then I'm not a loud black woman, right? Um, so there are, there are things that you can do in terms of to, to still stay true to who you are, but just realize how to adjust for the culture. And that's what I call it. It's just like if you were to go to Tokyo or you were to go to France or you were to go to South Africa and you were trying to do business, you don't have to change who you are, but you do need to learn how to fit within the culture and be heard and understood within the culture. Well, frankly, working in a male dominated environment, same thing, it's just a culture. Well, so you've had lots of experiences. I mean, starting in IBM and you worked at Blockbuster, lots of other companies. Can you talk a little bit about those different experiences and what you learned in each one of them or something you'd take away from that range of, of opportunities you had? Oh, absolutely. So IBM, where I spent actually almost 14 years, and the big things I learned in IBM was, as I said, how to sell. So how to sell your ideas, get things done, et cetera. I also learned how to ask for what I wanted. Um, and I learned how to build relationships. And then when I went to Blockbuster, my big learnings there were, I had always had a strong network, but my network was always within IBM because it's a huge company and I was being moved around a lot. So I really didn't build a big network outside of IBM. And when I got to Blockbuster, that was my big learning was, wait a minute, I needed to have people outside of this company who can also give me perspective and advice and all of those things to help me do a good job at the job, right? That I held, so that was one. Um, and then heading off, and then, and then the other thing is just learning about the whole um, tech, technology and working in environments where people are, don't actually have strong technology perspectives because that was true at Blockbuster. And then getting to Silicon Valley, oh gosh, um, so much because that's where, yes, I was the chief marketing officer and EVP at sales at two newly public companies, um, North Point as well as LoudCloud. So that's really where I learned about talking to investors, right? Pitching to boards, um, indeed understanding what's important, how do you scale and at the same time put processes and things behind it to make sure you don't like scale right off the cliff. Um, and then metric stream, I just learned a ton because that was such a broken company when I got there. And a lot of, frankly, all the little things I had gained along the way really came together to help me execute as a strong leader at MetricStream. That's great. Now, I, I know that one of the things that is such a powerful tool, um, I'm sure in all of these roles, is low, learning how to negotiate and to advocate for yourself. How do you approach negotiations? I know this is something that is often you know, missed in teaching in school, teaching people actually how to negotiate for themselves. Can you give maybe an example of a negotiation that you've had about a new role or promotion that turned out to be pivotal in your career? Absolutely. And I guess the one I'll pick, there are a few, but the one that I will pick because it's the one frankly I'm most proud of um, is when here I am in Dallas, Texas, I'm at Blockbuster and I'm trying to get to Silicon Valley. So I have an opportunity for the chief marketing officer role at a company called North Point. North Point was back when you did high-speed internet, one of the first DSL lines, et cetera. So they wanted, a, they, I'm not, sorry, they're not chief marketing officer. They wanted EVP of sales. So they wanted EVP of sales. And I was like, okay, right, this I can do. Company's exciting, the whole bit, benchmark capital, um, lots of good people um, in terms of around it. But I asked them, what, how are you going to measure success? When I'm talking to the CEO, how are you going to measure success of this role? 
And what she said was, it was a she, she said, I want growth, right? So grow revenue, grow lines, et cetera. And we need to improve our cost of sale. We need to get more efficient. I said, okay, if that's what you want to do, then I have to have marketing as well. And she goes, well, we already have marketing people. And I said, I understand that. But if you want not just growth, but you also want to optimize the cost of sale, marketing plays a key role in that. And I need to have both. Well, they gave me both. So I became the EVP of sales and the chief marketing officer, but it didn't stop there. Because then I said, okay, they came back to me and said, great, you now have the roles. Here's the comp, here's this, right? And I said, yes, I just need one more thing. You need me to be successful quickly because the market is moving so fast. The best way I can do that is I need to bring my assistant with me mm -hmm. because she absolutely enables me to optimize my work, myself and my schedule, et cetera, right? So bottom line is not only did they move me and my family and give me a job twice as broad as they initially planned, but they moved my assistant and her family from Texas to Silicon Valley. Fabulous. I think a really interesting um, lesson in there is A, being really clear about what you do want, like actually realize, you know, being very thoughtful beforehand and being willing to ask for it, right? right? I mean, they might have said no, and it might have been a not yet situation, but uh, you, you, if you didn't ask, you were never going to know whether that was possible. Exactly right. And that's what I tell people. If you aren't getting no's, you're not asking for enough. So it's okay to get a no. You, not, if they have told me no, well, that would have been no different than if I never asked them in the first place, right? right. So always ask. Yeah, and and it's um, I mean it's it's fascinating. They had already made the decision that they wanted you, right? They had already made that decision, and so once they were already committed, you now were in a place where you could say, okay, you know, in order to make this work, here are some things I really need to be successful. And I like the fact that you framed it that way. You want me to be successful here. Here's what I need to make to be successful for you. Absolutely, you always have to. It's the win-win part of it, Tina. You always have to make sure that you're clear when you're negotiating and having conversations, what's in it for the other party, mm -hmm. right? Why should they do it? You want them to actually want right. to do it. It's not just give you something, but you want them to want to do it. And that's why it's so important. So two points that you raised. One is yes, always make sure it's the win-win, but the other is know your power and when you have your power. If I had asked for that, like right up front, it never would have happened. Right. Never would have happened. Right. If you would, if when they first start talking to said, I need sales and I need marketing and I need to bring my assistant, they're like, goodbye, Shelly, see you later. But once they were already committed, you right. now had the power to be able to ask for what you wanted. But you Absolutely. Know what you wanted, which I thought was, you know, super important for you to take the time to consider that. So I, you've obviously accomplished so much and you do so much. How do you manage your time, right? All of these boards, I know that each one of these has got to be a really big responsibility and, and time commitment. All these leadership positions, how do you scale yourself and deal with the demands so that you, you know, just don't burn out? It's, you know, two things. One, it's about prioritization and self-care. I learned the whole self-care piece the hard way. So trust me, when I say self-care, self-care. In my late 20s, I literally burned myself out. I, en I ended up with some depression. I had to see a clinical psychologist. I mean, when I say burn myself out, I did. And by the way, I talk about all that in the book because it's important to share. This is not easy. This is hard stuff. Um, and so I learned, all right, I got to make sure I take care of myself. So with that as the base, prioritization. It really is about what's important. And the way I always try to think about it is, all right, here's a list of things that need to get done. What is really important? What am I the best person to do? Because you know, there's a lot of times there's things on your list and you're not necessarily the best person to do it. Other people can do it. Doesn't mean you can't do it, but there might be somebody else that's better to do it. Which means you actually need to let go. You can't do everything. I don't do everything. Nobody does everything. The key is to be conscious about what you won't, don't do versus letting things fall off your plate. Because letting things fall off the plate means you're not gonna be doing a good job at whatever it is. So be conscious and push stuff off your plate. <laughs> so that- Have people you pull it off it. your plate, yeah. Exactly, be yeah. in control. Don't let exactly. it fall, push exactly. it, right? Yeah. Um, 
but that is honestly what, what I've done, but it really is. Uh, it's, um, it's making sure that you don't retain responsibility for everything. You know, I was in a, I had a long-term marriage um, until my husband passed away. My, I have two kids, right? I now have grandchildren, but my, my point in sharing that is there were things that I never did. I did not have responsibility for, and I did not do. I'll give you an example. From the time I got married, I did not do laundry, not once. My husband might ask me, oh, Shelly, would you mind pushing the, moving one load from the washer to the dryer, right? So he might ask me that if I'm walking past where the laundry room is. I did not do laundry. So if I needed something and it was still dirty, I just did without. I was not going to touch laundry because that was not my job. So being real clear about what you're going to do, what you're not going to do, and then actually letting go. I have a picture on my wall to this day. It's my, one of my favorites of my daughter with her hair kind of messed up. And let me explain what I mean. When we divided and conquered. So he now has hair duty. Well, my husband is, you know, big, big hands. He's never braided little girls, thick curly hair. Right. But he needed to learn. So did when he did it and it was kind of messed up, did I redo it? No, she doesn't care. And he's got to learn if I went and redid it after he did it, then he wouldn't do it anymore. Right. And then I still have the job. So it's picture day and her hair is supposed to be braided and then kind of crossed over like a little crown. Well, by the time it came time to take the pictures, one braid's hanging down. It's kind of unraveling. The other one's pinned up on the head because he didn't. And you know what? It. It's, a, it's fabulous, right? right. It's adorable. Right. It, it, yep. And it's on the wall, right? Yeah. The, the, <laughs> point, the point and is. Story. Exactly. The point is do not try to own everything. You do not need to be perfect about everything and don't worry. And this is the hardest part. Are you listening? This is the hardest part. Okay. You give up the guilt, right? Why do you care? Because you either feel guilty or you feel judged, right? It's one of the two. And at the end of the day, you decide, you need to decide what you should be judged on. And I decided that how my daughter's hair looked was not how I was going to be judged. <laughs> it's and great. Yeah. So one of the students asks uh, a question related to this. Um, he wants to know that as a student, how do I push things off my plate, right? You don't necessarily, you don't have, as a student, have someone you can delegate to. How do you decide your priorities? And, you know, if you've got a lot of interests, you've got a lot of people in your life. How do you decide when you're a young person and you can't delegate uh, the laundry to someone else? How do you, uh, how do you make that happen? All right. So you actually still can. And let me talk about that. So when I went to Wharton, I was working 20 hours a week, um, which is a lot when you're still a full-time student. So I understand, right? Here's the challenge. The key really is prioritization. And it means there's some things that you just can't, can't do. So I was really disciplined about, all right, here's what has to be done when. Now, what do I mean by you can still delegate? My roommate and I, at my suggestion, we, we shared laundry duty, all right? So it's like, okay, you do it, you know, this, this time you do both, right? And then I'll do it. But that way, you know what? You do laundry half the time. Um, and it takes about the same amount of time. You just take more washers or dryers, right? Because you're in the big area. So there are things that you can still do in terms of sharing to create time for yourself by, frankly, helping others, right? Um, but the big thing is look at how you really are spending your time and making sure that it matches with your priorities. Many times it actually doesn't. You have the list, but if you really map back for the week, how did I spend my time compared to what my priorities were? A lot of times it actually doesn't match. Really good point. Now I want to invite the students uh, who are watching to ask questions. We've got a few that have already come in and I want to invite you because we've got about 20 more minutes. And if you want to get a question in, please make sure to, to write it down in the Q&A. Um, I, I want to go to a question that one of the students asked is, um, you know, you've been given the opportunity. Um, sometimes they're really big opportunities and they might be sort of beyond your current capabilities. How do you deal with the uncertainties around taking a big leap when the job you're taking um, feels much bigger than something you've ever done before? You know, sort of how do you get over those insecurities? 
Right. So two things. One, I come, you know, in general, that's really called imposter syndrome, right? Which is when you think that, ooh, I really don't have all that I need to be able to do this, or somebody's going to figure it. If I take this job, somebody's going to figure out I don't know as much as I, you know, as I think I know, all those things, uh, which I also talk about a lot in the book, because I've dealt with imposter syndrome my entire life. They studies show that just about everybody does, but women in particular definitely experience it a lot more than men and women of color, according to studies, actually experience it the most. So how do you handle it? First of all, realize that a lot of people feel it. So it's okay. Second, realize every time, every time you take a big leap forward, you're starting at the bottom rung of the next ladder. And that's true for everyone. And if you really want to make progress, you want to get to the top of a ladder, jump to the, the bottom rung and go again. If you keep just jumping mid rung, you're not going to go very far, very fast. So it's called taking risk, which is also okay. But how do you get over it? So number one, realize everybody feels that way. Uh, number two, if somebody's offered you the role, then they obviously believe that you can do it. Believe them. <laughs> All right. They're telling you they believe they have confidence in you. Believe them. And if that's still not enough, Fake it until you make it, you know, walk in, put your shoulders back and say, okay, today I'm playing the role of project manager of brand new company XYZ, right? And eventually you're going to figure it out. And if that's still not good enough, I tell people get cheerleaders. And I mean cheerleaders, rah, rah, go, Tina, go, Betsy, go, <laughs> Dan, right? Cheerleaders, people who remind you when you're feeling totally incompetent and incapable and all this, remind you of who you are, remind you of the skills, the education, what you've actually done, right? Building you up because so much in the world today is tearing us down, telling us how we're not quite, and then fill in the blank. We're not quite smart enough, not quite techy enough, not quite pretty enough, not quite young enough, not quite, I don't know, right? All these things were not enough. Well, the good news is you really are. And if you don't believe it, then have somebody I don't care who it is, be your cheerleader. I've had cheerleaders my whole life. My husband was my biggest cheerleader. And if you don't have one, appoint somebody. Say, okay, sis, you're now my cheerleader. And here's what this means, because Shelly said I need a cheerleader, right? So go get a cheerleader. So I, I really think this is important. And I think that there are two types of cheerleaders that people often don't distinguish between mentors and sponsors. I love the idea that a mentor is someone who basically gives you advice. You know, you can say, hey, help me figure out how to do this, but sponsor those people who really help promote you. You're the ones who are saying, you know, that's Shelly. I worked with her and she's doing an amazing job. I see true potential there. So can you tell us a little bit about the mentors and sponsors that you've had to help you on your way? Because I think that behind every person who's successful, having mentors and sponsors ends up becoming a really secret weapon. Absolutely true. And yes, I have had mentors and sponsors throughout, and it is really, really important. But let me share a story because it was a, I learned a great lesson early, relatively early in my career, um, probably, I don't know, six years into my career, something like that. I mean, I was at IBM and IBM decided that high potential employees, they wanted to make sure had mentors. And so they decided that they're going to ask the employees, who would you like to be your mentor? Because a lot of other ways don't work. So fine. I get the request. Who do you want to be your mentor? Well, I picked a gentleman by the name of Roland Harris. Roland was somebody a couple levels above me. I knew him. I thought he liked me. I said, great. Well, a couple days later, I get a call. It's Roland. Shelly, hi, Roland. Shelly, you put my name down to be your mentor. And I'm thinking, well, yeah, Roland, I, I thought you liked me. And he says, Shelly, you've got me. Go get somebody else. And I went, oh. So that taught me a couple things. One, I had mentors I didn't even know, right? Because they weren't formal. We never had a conversation about it. Um, and number two, if I can have one, I can have two, I can have three, I can have as many mentors as possible. And so that's what I started doing. I said, all right, fine. I'm gonna go get a bunch of mentors. And I also learned don't ask people because they're gonna typically say no, because they don't have time and they don't think you're gonna be a good mentee, which you're probably not. <laughs> and we'll talk, we can talk about that if you want to, Tina. But what I did is I adopted mentors. I just started treating them like mentors. 
when I realized that Roland was actually a mentor and I didn't know it, I said, oh, okay. So I would just start asking people simple, easy questions, you know, or advice. And then I always followed up and that's the key. You have to follow up. The mentors need something too. This is not a one-way thing. This is a relationship. So you need to get value and give value. And the biggest value you can give a mentor, frankly, is appreciation, is knowledge that intrinsically they helped because most people want to help deep within them. So go adopt mentors, have as many as you can possibly support. And then what happens a lot of times is as you work hard and do well and rise, many mentors can become sponsors because now they want to claim you. It's like, oh yeah, Shelly. Oh yeah. I've, I've been giving her advice on the side, right? <laughs> this is all me, <laughs> you know, but that they do. Um, and they'll open doors for you. So I've had many a mentor turn into a sponsor. Great. And I'm going to guess that a lot of these people, just like the example you gave are mentors, but they don't have that label, right? There are lots of people in your life. In fact, there are people who might say to me, Hey, you were a mentor, but I never saw myself as such. Right. So you, the relationship doesn't have to be formalized. Exactly. It's that these people play an informal mentorship role or an informal sponsorship uh, without having the, the formal label. Absolutely. So we have a student who asks a very big, broad question. What motivates you? You know, what is it that it keeps you driven to keep succeeding? All of this is a lot of work, a lot of energy, a lot of time. What, what drives you? What motivates you? Oh, gosh. So there's a, there's a couple things, honestly. Early on, because I, I was raised, you know, I believed growing up that the odds just weren't in my favor to get anything. I didn't think the world expected much of me. And therefore, what drove me initially was, frankly, the credibility, right? I wanted to prove that I really was somebody and could make a difference and could make an impact. And then as I got into my career, what really drove me to keep pushing and going forward is one, I like to win, frankly, and I set a goal. So if I set a goal, I'm going to go achieve the goal because that's, that's who I am. But what really helps me wake up in the morning excited, right? And work as hard as I do is the impact. The best, you know, of all the things that I've done, what gives me the biggest joy is knowing that there are people that have worked with me or engaged with me or that I've mentored or whatever that have gone on to achieve their aspirations that are now CEOs that are now starting their companies, right? Or that are now whatever it is that they wanted to go do and they're doing it. And that feels great. So it really evolved from, I just want to be credible to yes, I want to achieve because I'm competitive and ambitious to really making an impact and how big and broad an impact can I make? So this uh, leads into a question that was asked by one of the students about using your position as a leader in a company to encourage social change, right? You're talking about having impact on individual people, but can you talk about the how you might use the position you're in for broader issues around social justice that, that might influence the companies that you're either leading or on the boards of. Absolutely. Cause I do that. I do that every day. Um, you know, I, uh, let's see, currently I can talk about currently. So currently I'm an advisor now to Forbes Ignite. So Forbes, which I'm sure you're all familiar with Forbes created this Forbes Ignite um, unit as a, as a unit missioned with, let's figure out how we leverage the power of Forbes, the reach, the voice, et cetera, to actually drive social change. So Forbes reached out to me and was interested in my doing something with them that I wasn't interested in. But I said, listen, what I am interested in is figuring out how can we improve relations between community and police? Because I've always believed if we could, if, if business would just use their power, they could make an incredible impact on local government, right? Um, so Forbes got behind that. So now we're actually driving a, this big initiative. We're doing research, the whole bit. So stay tuned on what comes out of this, but you can absolutely leverage. And then locally, I've got a group of CEOs and some companies behind an initiative that we're working with San Jose on that's too early to talk about, but also in the social justice space. So the answer is I do that all the time. 
Wonderful. Well, so I, I want to talk a little bit about your role on boards because that's a very prestigious and important role in a company. Can you explain a little bit about what you do in your role as a member of a board of directors of a public company? Absolutely. So a board role is really a governance role. Our job on behalf of the shareholders is to make sure that the company has the right strategy, the right management in place, that they are operating under following the laws, but also operating within a good risk um, profile and are good corporate citizens, treat people right. I mean, all, all those things, right, that you have there. But we are a governance role. The board doesn't do anything operationally. You know, people will ask questions like, well, gosh, did you decide to do this or do you approve to that? It's like, no, no, no. We are really a governance role. We approve the strategy, right? We approve budgets, you know, all those kinds of things, but the company actually executes. So that's what the role of the board is. Now, the board has a lot of power because the number one job of a board is hiring and firing the CEO. So the CEO works for the board of directors and therefore you have the ability to ask questions, understand, right? What's happening, um, help drive priority and things like that. Absolutely. Yeah, it's such an interesting, uh, when did you t get on your first board? What was the first board you were on? Uh, so the first board I got on, I was 42 years old. It was Arbitron, a public company. They were a media um, research firm. People may remember way back the Arbitron ratings on radio. They ultimately were bought by Nielsen. Um, but yes, but I was on that board for about seven or eight years. Great. Well, super interesting. Now, I know the students have very tactical questions that relate to their own personal lives. So I'm going to make sure that we dive into those in our last time together. So okay. uh, one of the questions that most of the students want to know, and it's a question I always like to ask is, you know, what skills can you develop as a student now that's going to set the stage for your stay for your success later? That is sort of what do you wish you knew when you were 20? Sure. Well, there are a couple. So one, I will tell you communications. I can't tell you how important it is to be a good communicator. And when I say be a good communicator, yes, am I talking on stage, et cetera? The answer is absolutely. But it's beyond that. It's in meetings. It's in one-on-one. -on -one. Are you effective? Are you clear, right? Are you concise? Can people understand? I mean, all being a good communicator is really important. Uh, two, courage. You know, people think that folks are born with courage. There isn't a human being on the planet that is born with courage. Nature makes sure of that. We're actually born scaredy cats. That's how you protect yourself. So if you have courage, it's because you've built that muscle. And I will tell you, there's not enough courage in the world. And if you indeed develop courage, it will take you a long way. I, st I it's one of the, you know, on, on boards, we get assessed, right? You self-assessments, peer assessments, you know, et cetera. And one of the feedbacks that I get often is I'm admired for my courage. So I will tell you, courage is something that you can absolutely start building now. And what is courage? Courage is willing to do what's uncomfortable when you know it's right. It's willing to speak up when you believe or feel something, even though you're making yourself vulnerable, right? Courage is basically something that you can be building all the time because yeah, we right. all have situations in which we didn't do just that when we should have. Right. Doing the hard thing when it's the right thing, even though there might be some consequences and, and you don't might not know exactly what's going to happen. So yeah. really great. I, I love that. Um, so uh, the students are also really curious about just they're thinking about their own life. And, you know, do I have to sacrifice my social life? Do I have to sacrifice, you know, the things that, you know, bring me joy in my life in order to be successful? You know, or how do I, how do I make sure that when I'm doing these things that are not part of work, like socializing, that align with my priorities? Okay, so first of all, you've just hit a trigger word for me, and that is sacrifice. I don't like the word sacrifice. If people ask me, Shell, have you made any sacrifices? My answer is no. Now, what have I made? I've made choices. I've made trade-offs. Absolutely. And hard ones for sure. But the reason I don't like the term sacrifice 
is sacrifice to me. And I'm giving you my definition. Sacrifice to me is when you do something on behalf of someone else. I do something for somebody else. I sacrifice for you. Well, as soon as I sacrifice for you, I have just given my power away, right? Because now I'm not in control. I'm doing this for you, not for me. Wrong. We need to take ownership of our decisions. We need to make choices and make trade-offs and decisions that we own. When you do that, you keep your power. So have I made tough trade-offs and things? Absolutely have, but I own them and I did them with eyes wide open. So when you say, how do you, how do, you do all this? It really comes down to establishing what's important. And then based upon that, right? It's taking action. Now, let me tell you what's important to me. With everything that I've done, I'm a people person. So I like getting together with people and I happen to like to eat. I like to cook. I like to entertain, drink wine. I like all those things. So I believe in integrating my life so I can do more things at the same time. So I started a gourmet dinner club when I moved to the Bay area. I started a gourmet dinner club, not that everybody had to be great cooks, but I started it because that allowed me to do in one event where I could cook, eat, drink wine, socialize with people, right? Entertain all in one. So think about how you can accomplish multiple things in one way. I love the performing arts. So when we go see a ballet or a concert, et cetera, Scotty and I, my husband, and I, we rarely go alone. More than that, I'd make outings out of a number of these things and we'd invite like 50 people. I mean, it's a big event. I'm going to go anyway, right? So figure out how you actually put things together so that you can accomplish multiple tasks at the same time. That yeah, was and there are lots of ways to do that. There are there. I mean, I know some VCs who always take their meetings walking, right? So it's like, okay, I need to get exercise. I want to take this meeting. Come and join me on this walk. I do the same thing. I call them walks and talks. Yep, I fully, fully agree. So just think about, you, there's always ways to do it. Now, can you do absolutely everything? No. Do I get to see every single play and every single concert I want to see? Absolutely not. But I do get out there when we can, not during COVID. Um, but before that, I used to get out there and absolutely still do those things. So uh, there's a question that um, a lot of people want to know about is about, um, they, they're reflecting back on you're talking about going through really tough times when you were younger. And uh, I mean, listen, if you talk to almost anyone who's been successful, they have at some point pushed themselves so hard that they finally cracked. They kind of hit their limits. They found how far they could go. How did you work through that? What was it that you had to do to get to the other side of that really difficult time? I had to get help. Um, I actually, I started, I went to see a, a psychologist and we had sessions and had to talk to try to understand. And what I learned from that is that I was giving all of myself away. I was, the, how I was spending my time, what I was doing, I was just giving it all away. I was doing almost nothing to feed my soul, right? And to feel, feed myself. And that's what I meant by self-care is so important. And I learned that the hard way. So, you know, nobody does any of this stuff alone. And it's all about finding the right kind of help for when you need it. Because trust me, you will need help all along the way. I absolutely have. Yeah, I, I think that's really, really important. And also to understand that this is something that um, everybody, you know, lots of people go through, right? Hitting that wall and figuring out how they need to get yes. help to, to get back up on their feet. Absolutely. Great. So there's another question about, um, and I don't know exactly the context here, but the question is, how do you deal with direct competition? And I don't know whether we're talking about competition like another company or another person. Maybe there's another salesperson you're competing with. I mean, do you perceive competition in the, in the world? Do you see yourself as a competitive person? How do you, how do you engage with that? I, I know that uh, oftentimes there are people who are very driven, who are not competitive. And also there are people who are competitive, who are competitive, you know, as well as driven. So how do you think right. about that? So first of all, I am the eldest of four. My parents had four children in less than five years. Boom, 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 boom. I'm competitive. 
we're all competitive. Uh, so yes, I'm definitely competitive. Uh, when, but you know, what's interesting. I never, I don't know that I ever looked at it as I'm competing against a person for something, you know, I, so I would compete. Yes. Cause I, I want to finish on top and I want to do better. Like when you're in sales, you know, this person's 120% a quota and you're trying to get better. And so, yeah, I would compete that way. Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. If, if, if the question is trying to get at, do I ever see myself as competing? It's like you and me for, you know, against the world. So only one of us is going to win and one is going to lose. I don't think I necessarily felt about things that way. I've always felt there's enough opportunity out there for everybody eventually. So I'm sorry, I'm probably not answering what- No, you but I think this is a really good point because I'm just gonna be a little personal here about myself yeah. is that people often think I'm very competitive, but I'm not at all, I'm very driven. And I think that it's possible to be very driven, but also seeing a place for everybody else to have success as well. And it sounds like that's sort of what, the way that you engage with the world. Mm -hmm. Yes. I do. Great. So as we head into the final few minutes here, I wonder if you could tell us if you had a single superpower, what would that be? What is your superpower? Clearly, you have been remarkably successful in your career and have just accomplished more than probably you ever even imagined you could. Um, what is the superpower that's allowed you to do this? So it ends up being two and I know yes for one. So if I had to give one first, the first one is discipline. I am super disciplined. Um, and the other is courage, which I mentioned before. So, but discipline plays a role because it allows me back to you set priorities and you live by the priorities. If you're disciplined, you can do that. Uh, you know, example, I was a night person coming out of college. I was a night person. Well, when I had children, it was like, oh, if I stay a night person, I'm going to have zero time for myself. And so literally, I even read up how to do this. Every week, you move your clock up, your time or your wake up time, 15 minutes, right? kind of at a week, and you can get yourself. But I literally trained myself to become a morning person. Not because that was something that I just aspired to do, but it was self-preservation, right? So you can be whatever you want to be. But yeah, I'm, I'm very disciplined. So I put a plan in place, I execute the plan. And then I make decisions every day consistent with that, which is another thing that a lot of people don't do. And I talk about how to do that and how to think about that in the book as well, because it's really I, about being intentional with your actions. I really love this because I think what, what I've heard as an underlying theme of the entire discussion is that you are extremely thoughtful about what's important to you and then you craft your life around those priorities and those goals. And I think that a lot of people don't do that. They are sort of a leaf in the wind re being reactive as opposed to proactive. And so I think um, that you're an incredible example of someone who what can you can accomplish if you are very, very clear about your objectives, put a plan in place and uh, very uh, consciously move towards those goals. Absolutely. 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 Well, this has been an amazing discussion. I encourage everyone, if you want to learn more, and I certainly do, uh, to pick up a copy of Shelley's new book, Unapologetically Ambitious, comes out on October 6th. And also, I want to remind you that next week, our speaker, uh, Delane Parnell, has to shift his schedule. So the talk next week is going to be at 1 o'clock as opposed to 4.30. You can watch it live at 1 o'clock or tune into e uh, the eCorner YouTube channel to watch it anytime you like. And uh, really hope that you'll join us next week for another fabulous session. Shelly, can't thank you enough for helping us kick off this year. It has been truly an honor and a pleasure. And we wish you the very, very best of luck with the launch of your book. Well, thank you very much, Tina. I really appreciate you having me. And by the way, feel free to follow me on LinkedIn or connect. If you want to connect, though, reference this so I know I don't respond to everybody, but just put a comment in or something. I try to put out a lot of stuff on LinkedIn to share ideas thoughts and advice. Wonderful. Thank you so, so much.